Well, hello, everyone. Um, I am a very casual style speaker presenter, so if you have questions when I'm going along, just let me know. Um, I'm going to try to focus mostly on the plants, but just for the sake of storytelling, I'll also put some other contextual slides in. Um, you know, there's so many drought tolerant plants that, that I'm going to show you just a few of them. Um, and, and I brought a bunch of what I call my, my, uh, my handouts, my propaganda handouts that are in the back. I hope you saw them. And so if you're interested in either um, coming and seeing all of our display gardens that we have, there's um, a map that you can use to navigate around. There's examples of our newsletters. Um, and if you are thinking of actually coming to the sale, we're having a plant sale on Saturday, and then we'll have two more this fall if you're not quite ready yet. And um, if you do become a member, I brought some Join the Friends brochures because it tells you all the discounts that you get. So you get discounts on sales. Plus, we have partner nurseries. If you're a member, you can discount there also, not just from us. So there's lots of different things back there. And please take them all, <laughs> everyone. Um, so, so one of the things I, I'm sure you're all aware of is like when I walk around, I walk for exercise whenever I get a chance. And I walk around and I look at where people have turned off their water in their yard. And, I kind of despair a little because I'm a plant person, you know, it's like, and there's just dirt and brown. And I think we have to have beautiful landscapes. I mean, it's going to bring down the property values. It, it causes heat island effect where things will just get hotter and hotter. It's going to cause erosion of bare soil and, and pollution of the rivers. And so we really need, I think, to have some viable solutions we can offer to people and some examples for what they can have instead of bare dirt and really use very little or even maybe no uh, supplemental water. This is just from the DWR website. And this, I started doing talks like this about 10 or 15 years ago. And so we were kind of ahead of the curve of people uh, wanting to know stuff. And uh, at first, nobody paid any attention to me. And now I'm very popular. <laughs> this is just a really dramatic picture of a comparison of 2013 and 2014. Does this have a pointer? Oh, I see it. That's the pointer, I guess. OK. OK. Um, and you can see how scary it is that there's no water and there's no snow up in the mountains because that's where most of the what, what, what I always saw as that we really had a lot of water here for being a Mediterranean climate. But it, m the majority of it is stored in that snowpack. And that's what's used for agriculture as it melts and runs down. So this is the climate change. And this is why even if we get an El Nino, you really I don't think there's going to be any going back. I think that having ornamental landscapes that are beautiful, that people can enjoy, that will beautify your home, that they, they're going to have to use drought tolerant plants from now on. It's just the sensible thing to do. But does it have to look like that? <laughs> I always think, um, you know, I don't want it to be Arizona. It's not Arizona. Or as my friend likes to say, arid zona. And, um, you know, we don't have to use cacti. We can use other plants that, that are, don't look like that. In general, we can't use so many of the large-leaved plants, because most of the things that are large and lush and tropical looking, those are the higher water users. But this is a low water garden. This is the Terrace Garden downtown next to uh, Whole Foods. It's an older photo. Um, it's changed a bit since then. But we, from the beginning of this, once this was established, we only watered it every two weeks. And so it's considered low water. Well, the amount of water, the run time, the amount we put on, and we've always said the Arboretum depended on these infrequent irrigations, but really deep irrigations. So by doing that, you train the roots of the plants to go down deep because after the first week, the top dries out and they're like, the roots are like, where's the water? And they realize it's down lower and so then they grow nice and deep. And that's what makes, in addition to just being able to live in less water, what makes a, any plant more drought tolerant is to have these nice deep roots. So this is kind of redundant. I saw that it's the five things. Um, but these are things that before you go to pick out your plants, you want to make sure that you've thought of these other things. I think the biggest change that a lot of people have made is realizing that it's not OK if water's in the gutter. 
You know, I used to always go around and see water in the gutter. And this drought has really kind of cured people of that. And <clears throat> I even think, you know, I was joking with a man because we had a really high water bill one when some people were house sitting for us when we were away. So my husband got all agitated and, and called the, the water police, you know, <laughs> and the guy came to the door and I said, are you the water police? And he's like, you know, because I could tell he was worried I was going to yell at him or yell on him about something or anything, but that's just kidding. Um, efficient irrigation is, requires thinking or paying someone else to think about it for you. Um, the other things I think are pretty clear. Um, effective use of mulching for water conservation is really huge. Um, improving your soil. And then this last one is the one I'm going to address today, choosing low water trees, shrubs, flowers, and ground covers. The other thing I want to emphasize now is the first year, your drought tolerant landscape is going to need a lot of water. And the reason is when it first gets to your house, the little root balls in a little shape of that can that you buy it in, you put it in the ground and you water it and you say, it's drought tolerant, I don't have to do anything else. But what happens is because the roots are only in that really small area, they, it dries out really fast. And it can't, doesn't have any roots in the other soil yet. So even if the soil around it is wet, it can't get it because it hasn't grown out into it. So the first year, you're going to be training your drought tolerant plants by keeping that root ball moist at least the first six months and then monitoring its drought stress symptoms closely at least one year. And then if we don't have a t continue to have this drought, you know, you could even, even train them more the next year. But I did a turf removal on my front yard two years ago. And I kept a really close eye on it, <clears throat> watering it pretty regularly while it established. And then this year's the first year I just went to every two weeks, the second year. So, and even then I don't water it that much. And I don't water along my driveway and I found a lot of those plants don't need any water. You know, we kind of didn't appreciate that in, in the past, but there are plants we can grow that don't need water. The thing I get asked really a lot is, what is high water? What's medium water? What's low water? Well, this is the definition that I use that I try to make it more understandable to people. If you talk to people at the university that are scientists, they start telling you about the ETO and MWILO, and they start telling you about the percent that you're allowed to have depending, and, and they tell you all this technical stuff, and I think, wait a minute. What you want to really think about is your plants, if they need to not ever dry out, that's a high water plant. Because if you let it dry out, it'll get damaged. A medium water is the majority of trees and shrubs. Woody plants that are able to have extensive root systems. Um, and you can let the top of the soil dry out once the plant's established and it'll be fine. But you don't want it to, to um, go completely bone dry through the whole root zone. Low or infrequent watering <coughs> is using drought tolerant, heat tolerant plants. They'll tolerate not only uh, the dry surface, but they'll tolerate it some uh, being left like another week even. You know, the surface will be dry in a week, but another week. And they'll, they have enough quick root growth that they can still be mining the deeper water in the soil. And this is kind of where I think we're going to be going now, is this very low. Things that we can grow that we don't have to water at all. And then people can just not worry about it as long as it rains in the winter. Hey, it worked when I pointed the wrong way. <laughs> okay, how do I know how, whether a plant's high, medium, or low water? Um, there is something online, and I'm going to show you some pictures called Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. You go to a website, you type in Davis, it gives you, and then it says, what do you want to know? And you say, I want a, I want a list of very low water use plants. And it, bingo, it gives you the list. And it's very handy, it's pretty easy to use. If anybody has a problem using it, I'll show you. It's, it's, even I can do it, and I'm not very good with computers. Um, and in order to generate this database, what they did was they got teams of us horticultural plant nerd people, and they locked us in a room for two days together, and we just went through Latin names of plants and voted how much, in our experience, how much water those plants needed. It was plant nerd heaven. Am I doing something wrong? Oh. <laughs> Most of the collections in the, in the University Ar UC Davis Arboretum. Has anybody never been to the Arboretum? I didn't think so. OK, good. <laughs> My peeps. <laughs> um, the majority of it is this. This is very low. This is like once a month irrigation. 
And so it's got oak trees, red buds. This is a uh, desert shrub. This is the high water. This is the redwood grove. So this gets watered twice a week. This gets watered once a month. And the run times to saturate the soil are about the same. So it's about frequency. This is what Wuckles, the water use classification, looks like when you log on. You want to be sure to use this one that has the IV4 on it. And then you just, um, like I typed in right here, I typed in Davis. And then it says search for plants. And you can either, if you have a plant that you like, you want to use it, just type that plant name in there and then hit search and it'll give you the, the water use. It'll say high, medium, low, or very low. This is very handy where you can also say you're looking for a drought tolerant ground cover or some characteristic and you can say I only want very low trees and it'll give you the list that would plants that are recommended that will live in Davis. So it's pretty easy. No, but that's what Google's for. Oh, and you can download your list to Excel and print it out. So you can download this data to your own, make your own private spreadsheet to help you work um, while you're thinking about it. So I just put in, um, I just typed in rosemary, the common name rosemary, and these are all the plants I got that have the word rosemary in them. And you can see, look at how many of these are low, but that one's high. So it's kind of important, this is where knowing Latin names is very kind of handy and important that you, you need to try to find that out either from the nursery tag or from somebody at our plant sales or you know some brilliant landscaper that you, works for you who can help you figure out exactly what it is that you have. The other thing that's important is to, yeah. I just, Google, I don't, you know, I just Google Wuckles and it pops up and I click on it. I never even open books anymore. If you sign up for the workshop in the back and give us your email address, we will email you the link to this presentation as well as the link to the Wuckles page. Okay. Um, there is some debate about the pronunciation. I always said Wuckles, like chuckles, but <laughs> I have been, been reprimanded because it's water use. So you're supposed to say woo calls, which I find really awkward. <laughs> anyway, um, embracing Mediterranean design. It would help if we had the Mediterranean Sea, which we don't, <laughs> but we do have, we can grow all of these plants. And I went to Spain a number of years ago and I was shocked at how little landscaping they actually have there because they have very little water that is either, it's used either to drink, bathe, or for crops, and that's it. So they don't really have landscapes the way we do. And it's a lot of these, this style developed because of the lack of summer water in the Mediterranean. And we'll, we'll go to some of the elements, use firm but porous surfaces, any place you don't actually have a plant is gonna be, a water, you're not gonna need to water it. You provide shade, the plants will use less water if it's shaded. Um, you can still have some of your favorite high water plants, you just focus them in containers or in small areas. And then of course switching the kind of plants that you pick for the larger landscape. And, and they also use a lot of fountains, which we can't really do now because of our severe drought conditions. But in a normal um, kind of condition, I've actually heard people say that there's less evaporation from a pool of water than it is from a turf of the same size. Because think about turf, it's got all that surface area, whereas this is just the flat top. And I actually think that's quite attractive. This is our low water garden, which now it doesn't look like that anymore, it's a lot fuller. Um, it's down at the terrace where we incorporated some of those principles of Mediterranean garden style, put in shade, there's a cascading fountain, we expanded the decomposed granite surface areas and made a patio to create sitting areas where you can go get your lunch at Whole Foods or wherever one of those restaurants downtown and bring it out here and then you can sit and enjoy the garden. So it's a good place to visit if you've never been there. There's this thing they call hydrozoning, where you do what I just described. You take all your higher water plants, which is not supposed to be very many now, but you put them all in one place, and that's going to be the place you're going to look the most, where you're going to see it. And then as you move away from the views from your windows, your deck, your outdoor you know, living area, you'd use medium 
And then as you get farther back, you use all low or very low. So you can actually create these watering zones, and that saves a lot of water. So picking the right plants. Um, it's hard. There's a lot of plants out there, and there's a lot of, um, you have to figure out what you like. You have to figure out what are the things that appeal to you that you find beautiful. Um, but most of the plants that we have found to be pretty low water are in one of these categories. They're either native to California, or they're native to another summer dry climate, like the Mediterranean, parts of South Africa, Western, uh, southwestern tip of, of the little pit of Australia that sticks out, succulents, and then the bulbs that are leafless, like the naked ladies that are leafless in the summer. Using fewer plants and having spaces, that'll save water because the, each individual plant has a bigger area to draw water from and it's not competing with its neighbors, so that can help. And <clears throat> about 10 years ago now, we were sitting around one day and <clears throat> we always have to raise money, write grants, and raise our own funds to do projects. And my coworker was sitting there and she says, we have a lot of really drought tolerant plants out there, don't we? And I said, yeah. She says, I think we should give them a name. I'm like, what kind of name? And she says, what about Arboretum All Stars? And I go, nah, too sports metaphor. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. This program, 10 years later, is n known all over the state of California. The Master Gardener programs have adopted it. Um, it's just grown and grown and become what we call a sticky idea, where people, they get it. If you say All Star, they know what that means. So the whole, I was wrong. Um, and so we got together, we got a grant to make a list. We started with 50 and then we added 50 more of plants that we felt we could promote to people that they would use less water. Well, you put five horticulturists in a room and you ask them for their, their 100 favorite plants and you know what happens? They end up trying to choke each other because they totally don't agree. <laughs> so we developed criteria that what we want, the All-Stars, in order to make it onto the list, it had to be attractive, it had to grow in the Central Valley, it had to be in the Arboretum somewhere so people could look at it, and then it should be available at our plant sales. And that's some place we've kind of fallen down. We don't always have them all, but a lot of them now have moved out into the trade so that the wholesale growers are starting to grow them. Then we added, we also wanted these other benefits. We wanted it to be low maintenance, drought tolerant, so able, able to survive every two week water in October, I mean in uh, August, when it's 104. That, you know, there's times when I would say to the staff, can't you just give that a little extra water? They're like, no, it has to be drought tolerant. So, so we are over there practicing what I call hoard torture. We're, it's not horticulture. We're just trying to see, like, stretch the limits and see what plants can really tolerate. And, and we've really learned a lot from that. And my favorite thing is, is plants that attract beneficial wildlife. And when I say wildlife, I mean pollinators, butterflies, beneficial insects that eat bad insects, help control your pests, um, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are huge and so easy to attract. You know, I always say, if you plant that, you're going to have hummingbirds. If you come to our nursery and you walk up and down the aisles, there's just hummingbirds in every bed. It's really cool. And also we tried to vary the list, I tried to vary the list, to make sure there was something in bloom every season of the year, including the winter. If you go to www.arboretum.ucdavis.edu, and there is the, the, the link up there. And then you click here on the right, it says Arboretum All Stars. You get a summary of the program and the different things. There's some really handy stuff on here, one of which is this All Star database. So you, you click on that and you want to know what's good for hummingbirds. Well, you can go, or say, let's say um, you want a, sh a small shrub that grows in the shade. Well, actually, what I put in was the word salvia. So you can search either for the plant name or these characteristics, and then it says um, show hide options. Oops. What should I hit when it does that? There you go. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and then it pulls up a list based on the criteria. And there are more criteria hidden under here, which is hummingbirds, good for pollinators, pollinator conservation, um, and various other issues like that. 
This is one of our, these are two of our really starring all-stars. And if you get one of the newsletters back there, that's the one that we just put out from this year. And it's um, the 10 year anniversary of the Arboretum All-Star Program. And, and <clears throat> we've been working with researchers to test these plants to get scientific information about the amount of water they need and what they look like at different water levels and things like that. And this plant here, whether you watered it like twice in the summer, it's only two irrigations, or you watered it like every week, it looked the same. And it was like weird because everybody's like, how can that be? And, but it just was, it was just a really super adaptable plant. And, and we just didn't know that until then. We knew it wouldn't die without much water, but we didn't realize it would look just as good as if it had water. Um, this is the Sea of this Miss Valley Violet, which is really good for re really low water landscape. It stays small. It's a good size for the regular home yard. Um, and it's like a, a beautiful uh, lavender purple violet color. Whereas this one is concha. It's a much bigger thing. It's for bigger spaces. But when these are in bloom in our demonstration gardens, everybody buys them. They just fly out because the color is so beautiful. Um, what I did was I went onto the Wukal site and I looked up what the categories of high, medium, low, or very low water, and I wrote that in parentheses. So that's the Wukal's rating for this plant, for Davis. There's eight zones, or six zones in, in the Wukal's, and it's all the way from Southern California to Northern California, and then up into the higher elevation. Uh, this is St. Uh, Shrubby, St. Catherine's Lace. This attracts so many interesting insects that you can hear it. It kind of hums when you get close to it. It really needs full sun, um, but once established, it's super drought tolerant. It has white flowers, big flat topped heads of flowers. Uh, the Cleveland sage, this is in our native plant collection. It has these what I call shish kebab uh, flowers with the whorls and the spaces. The pipe vine swallowtail butterflies, I've seen feeding on it a lot. Um, and um, nectaring, and also hummingbirds. So, but there are also, I mean, doesn't just, those are a few of the natives we have, but I want to emphasize a lot of times, <clears throat> people only want to have native. And I just think, but it looks so much better if you mix things in. And one of the advantages of mixing California natives with non-natives is the California natives have a tendency to go naturally dormant in the summer, which means they bloom in the spring and then they don't do anything. They're, they're dormant, they're avoiding the dry. But the Mediterranean and some of the desert plants, they have a tendency to stay evergreen. And so you can mix them together so that when your natives aren't going off and flowering and being pretty, some of these other things will be. And these are also really low. This is a, a desert plant, the uh, bladder pod. It actually has a new name now, a uh, peritoma. And then the <coughs> calistamin, which is common in Davis, but this is a purple form that I had. I grew outside our nursery, and I watered it when it was young, and then I kind of forgot to check the irrigation system. And then I realized it wasn't getting any water for like three years, and it was fine. <laughs> uh, Leucophyllums. Uh, these are in the middle part of the Arboretum, and they're in bloom right now. Super beautiful silvery white foliage with these big cloud shapes, and then the uh, really pretty flowers. The honeybees like the flowers on this one. Like As I mentioned, we also put in some things for winter bloom. Um, this picture was actually taken like the day after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, and that thing was in full bloom. This is a fragrant, oops. A fragrant, um, uh, oh, now I did it, um, a Lanicera honeysuckle. I spelled honeysuckle wrong. Uh, that blooms in the middle of the winter in January. And so I love to go out in my yard. I have one in my yard, and I just go out and smell it and think of the sum that it's going to be, you know, nice again someday soon, <laughs> not too foggy and rainy. Um, bulbs are, are underused, I feel like, in, in our landscapes. And a lot of the bulbs, they have no leaves in the summer, so they don't need any water. This is just two. This is a little yellow crocus-looking thing, which is just uh, blooming now. And this is really interesting. It's very little seen, but we're here we're growing it under a pine tree in very thin soil, every two-week water, and that's what it looks like now. So it's just really, really great. And a lot of the bulbs we don't necessarily have or offer, but you can often get them online 
uh, through bulb companies. They're a lot less expensive that way too. And, but don't forget the other ones that we're more used to, they also have that same quality of not needing irrigation, which is the, most of the narcissus. Um, and then the, the naked ladies were the belladonna lilies, more polite name maybe. And um, the, we have some beautiful colored forms. That, there's a pure white one, some picatite types, and, and things like that.